Good evening and welcome to Sunday Interview. I'm your host, Gravazio Zulu. Now, away from politics, today on the program, we look at Zambia's biggest and arguably greatest sport, football. The sport has the largest following in the country and, of course, gobbles the biggest share of government and private sector sponsorship. But apart from a few regional trophies like the Kosafa and Sekafa and one Africa Cup glory, football has nothing or indeed little to show for all the love and support given from the fans and government. Where does the problem lie? Is it poor administration or just lack of talent? My guest tonight is a seasoned football administrator, author and broadcaster with over three decades of experience in the sport. I have on the program the Chief Executive Officer of the Football Association of Zambia, or the General Secretary, Ponga Liwewe. Thank Welcome you. to the program. Thank you very much. It's nice to have you. Pleasure. Always a pleasure to come back to ZNBC. I remember my days sitting here analyzing football, but now I come in a different vein. Well, um, I, I want to start probably on a very hard note with mm. you. Zambia's out of the Africa Cup, out of COSAFA, uh, out of uh, Africa Cup for the under-17. It seems fans will start missing your predecessors sooner than later. Have you failed to say it all? I think football is something that runs over a long term. And if a team or a generation of players starts to go through a dip, it's probably factors that uh, came in a few years ago that influenced the form. If you look at the success, for example, in 2012 when Zambia became African champions and the work for that end result started almost 10 years before when a change was made, for example, in the elevation of under 20, under 23 players and they were run through a program that eventually culminated in success in 2010. If you look at 2004, Zambia was not at the Africa Cup of Nations. 2006, Zambia went out in the first round in Egypt. Same story in Ghana, 2008. But by 2010, the team was settling down. The players were reaching maturity. Zambia was in the quarterfinal in Angola. And then, of course, we know that in 2012, Zambia became African champions. 2013, Zambia went out in the first round in South Africa. Similar story in 2015. So it shows you a cycle of a team developing, getting to the top of, of uh, reaching the peak, and then beginning to descend again, because obviously factors such as age begin to, to come in. And then it's time to rebuild a new generation. But that's a very short lifespan, if, 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 if you ask me. That's 10, 2010 to 2012, two years. Yeah, an, team, an, an entire team is gone, and, a and, team, a team, and we don't see this in yeah, Cameroon, we don't peaks. see this in Nigeria, we don't see this in, in well, bigger countries that have, that have achieved. Where is the problem? Well, it's, right? a, it's the structure of development, because you will have a generation of success, but if you don't have a development structure that continues to give you quality players coming through the ranks who will continue to, to move forward with the succession, then you'll find yourselves in a situation where one generation will reach the top. And then when they begin to age and, uh, and fade away, as is the case with any normal team, you don't have the quality or similar quality of players to step into the ranks because the developmental aspects of under 17, under 20, under 23 haven't really been focused on. So one generation ends and then you have a dip and then you must start from the bottom. So the key thing is to iron out those dips so that even if it dips, it's a slight dip. And if you look at teams, the likes of Germany, for example, the likes of the Netherlands who who are the dominant teams in African football, in uh, Euro world and European football. They have a continued string of generation of players coming through with very small dips here and there. So what you want to do is to make sure that the peaks and the troughs are not so deep by having a developmental process that continues to generate quality players over a period of time. So we had a team that deteriorated within a period of less than a year. I wouldn't say 2012, <laughs> 2013, we were gone. Well, they peaked 2013, you know, we were out in the first round. Yeah, we were out in the first round. Um, but it was still a team that could compete. I mean, when you looked at the, at the World Cup qualifiers, uh, you know, Zambia was there or thereabouts, although in the end didn't qualify for, for the World Cup around 2014. You know, but you could see that it's a, it's a team that maybe its, it's best days are behind it. And um, now we look at the era where a new generation of players is being integrated into the national side. Obviously, the, the integration is something you would have liked to start earlier and, and start on a more smoother scale because you don't want to do whole scale uh, integration and drop an entire generation and start with inexperienced players, no matter how good they are, because experience is also a factor. So our role as the association going forward is to, cont is to ensure that we have a generation of young Zambian talent that is being nurtured in the right way, 
if you look at the 70s, the peaks of Zambian football, the 80s, we had the ZCCM structures generating, you know, thousands of quality players. And those structures fall away. So now we rely more on an academy structure and development through uh, youth programs, which the association is now beginning to implement. So this is quite a big challenge because you do not have the structures fully supported by the private sector like in the past or fully supported by companies. Yeah, the CCM did support a big, huge chunk. Yeah, we had other companies like uh, com supported by by companies like uh, Vitaform, and those were really big teams supported by companies and not FAS. So now you have the whole burden to shoulder. Do you have the capacity? We're taking steps. Um, for example, the club licensing program. I think we'll talk about that later, where it will be mandatory for Premier League clubs to have youth development programs. Uh, the association itself is going to decentralize into the provinces and ensure that programs are running right across the country. Uh, we will partner with the corporate uh, world to ensure that more revenue flows into the game by making football more attractive as a vehicle for marketing. So those are some of the initial steps we are, we are taking right now to ensure that uh, over the next 20, 30 years, we have Zambian players of the highest quality who can compete at the highest level, you know, we had the Kalusha, Charles Musonda, Stone Yerenda, Lakim Siska generation playing in Belgium, in Europe. We want to take Zambian football back to that level. But if your youth programs start when somebody is 15, I mean, he, he has learned all the wrong things from the age of 12 without necessary backing. And you're playing against uh, countries at the highest levels whose kids from the age of four are working in a structured program and taught the basics of football from that early age all the way through of course, the programs are different as you grow older. But also, you need coaches who can understand. Because I may have played for Cowboy Warriors or for Kitwe United or, or Power Dynamos, but that doesn't necessarily give me the teaching ability to teach a four-year-old, to a six-year-old, to an eight-year-old. So those programs for the coaches, uh, the programs for the players to come through the ranks are, are key focus areas that Zambian football is, uh, is looking to address. You, you are talking youth football, and then the country gets banned for age cheating, yes. so call it in football. Does it get worse than that? <laughs> or, or does it get more embarrassing than that? An unfortunate situation for, so we, we, for we have the football. wrong youth in, in, in wrong teams. No, I think, I think there, there has been historically, you know, an element of players wanting to participate in these teams because they know that it opens doors for you to start in the under-17 national side, the under-20 national side. It puts you in the shop window. So you will find, you find a situation that uh, when documentation is requested by the association to verify age, sometimes that, ver that uh, documentation is not 100% authentic. Now, it's difficult for me if somebody brings a birth certificate that says with all the letterheads and all the relevant logos that indicate that this is a genuine document and it has been issued by a relevant office. It's very difficult for me to say, okay, he, the guy says he's, he's under 17. This is the documentation. You know, we don't have the means as an association to, to do that verification. Although, after the experiences of the COSAFA tournament, we will be looking to maybe engage those offices who hand out that documentation to go a little bit deeper into the records to, to verify that, uh, that uh, this is, in fact, uh, not a case of a document which was issued before being issued again with, uh, with a different year of birth. So we so have, those all, are some of the we have all these institutions you, you want to bl blame as far as problems. We're not blaming. You've got the, 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 the institutions saying, that issue documents. We are saying we You've need to work with them. You've got the hospital at, at, at play. You've got the coach. We are saying so we who, have to work with them as partners. Who's now. to blame in this case? Who was to blame for this case? For this embarrassing situation for the country? There are several points where, you know, Lapses. things could have been done better. I think from the association side, we could have maybe delved deeper into the verification and not taken... Um, as, as fact, the documentation that was provided to us. I think um, there was an issue of uh, MRI tests being done by an institution which gave us a, a wrong indication that the players were within the limits. Uh, the players themselves, you know, their young boys have been misled by some people at the clubs they come from, at uh, different levels of the game, sometimes even the parents because they want their kids to come through. So. You wouldn't really point the finger at one area, but there are several areas that need to be rectified, and that is what we are intending to do now going forward. Having discovered that uh, there were some one or two loopholes, some was, of them was, was it a passion by the association, the coach, the senior people, passion to win, desire to win? 
forced us to pay a blind eye to, to, to a person who clearly knew was above age? I don't think any association in its right mind would turn a blind eye to, to age cheating. And it wasn't at an institutional level that these things happened. I think it happened at an individual level. Because if you, even when you look at the sanctions imposed by COSAFA, uh, they were sanctioned against individuals. Yes, the association was fine because ultimately we, the association was responsible. But individuals took certain actions as individuals without the full backing of the association. I mean, as soon as we discovered an inquiry was, uh, an inquiry committee was put together to investigate the matter thoroughly. We're still waiting for a report from the medical institution and we're pushing them aggressively to get uh, their side of the story because there were some lapses on, on that side as well, which we, we struggled to understand how those came about. So we, we really dug deeply into this matter. And if you look at the correspondence from COSAFA, they actually stated that uh, they were really pleased that the association took immediate action and dug deeply to find out the root cause of this thing. It was a mistake. We've learned our lesson. And obviously, we will ensure that uh, Zambia does not go through this embarrassment again. And having said that, um, what would we really want to win an under-17 tournament when we know that overage players at under-17 will affect you at the higher levels of the game because you will not be getting the right players, getting the right development, and you'll be closing the door on your success in the Africa Cup of Nations, your ability to qualify for the World Cup. That's where the real target is. That's I, where I was we going to, to ask achieve. you, is, is, is what we're seeing as age cheating one of the reasons why we're not developing or one of the reasons why we have what we discussed earlier, a short life? much shorter lifespan for the players. You, you, you mature, after two years, you're out, you're out of the game. It's, it's I mean, if you're a 28-year-old playing at under-17 level, by the time you are, you are getting to the higher ranks, you are well past the age, and you are even going through the wrong sort of development at, at that level. So age cheating, and if you look at uh, across the African continent, we had uh, and probably still have an era where African teams are always among the top youth teams, you know, the teams in Europe, in South America, will be murmuring behind in the background saying, but look, I mean, this, this isn't right. You go and win the under-17, you, you get to the World Cup, you're out in the first round. Then what have you really achieved? You haven't really achieved development. You need to have proper young players coming through the ranks to make, at the end of the day, in 10 years' time, to give you the success you need at the highest level. And that's where you generate revenue. Under-17 tournaments are loss-making under 20 tournaments. In fact, FIFA is funded fully by the revenues from the main World Cup. So that's where you want to be. We want to walk away with $7 million for qualifying for the World Cup, which we can invest in our football. We're not looking at uh, winning a COSAFA tournament by cheating. When we know that the, the, the real fruit that will take Zambian football to the next level is at the highest level, there's no shortcut to it. We last didn't qualify to, 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 to Af AFCON. That was 12 years ago, and it has happened under your tenure feel bad? Of course, because Zambia is, a, is rated among the best countries in Africa. Zambia is a team that is respected, recognized uh, in African football. We've proved ourselves in the Olympic Games, beating the likes of Italy. It's a household name in, in football. So when the country doesn't qualify, uh, yes, we have to take responsibility as, as the association. Some of the early results, I think, affected the, the, the team because we had, for example, the draw with Guinea-Bissau at home. Uh, you know, which was in 2015. Uh, when uh, the new executive came in, I think they had only been in office for two days, and uh, again, they had no involvement in the preparation of the team. There was another draw against uh, Congo at home. We're not denying responsibility because it's one association. But uh, to point the finger and say, this executive is responsible for Zambia not qualifying, I think is a wrong approach. So where does the back stop? It stops with the association. We accept, as I said, full responsibility. But uh, you find an environment where there is finger pointing and saying, oh, this executive was better than this executive. We don't look at it like that. It's one association. It's a, it's a going concern. It's a concern where you know, individuals take over, but the institution continues. So we don't really have room for, for pointing fingers and saying, oh, these guys didn't do their homework or you didn't do your homework. At the end of the day, it's Zambia who loses. I was hoping you would say the back stops with the players. No. The players need uh, an environment to thrive. The players need an environment to grow. We sitting in the back rooms and in our offices need to create that environment. If we don't have players who have the quality to qualify, we can't say you are not a good player. We should ask ourselves why our structures are not generating players who can get to that level. 
Is our system correct? Are we putting everything on the table, on the ground for the players to get to where they are? At the end of the day, you know, countries are moving forward and if you are stagnant, rooted in doing the same things you've been doing for the last 20 years, you will be left behind. So if we're being left behind, we must look at ourselves and say, what do we need to do to get back on track and to move forward above everybody else? And where is the coach in the, in, in the equation? On day-to-day -day results, yes. You could, you could put that, uh, you know, on day-to-day -day results, you could look at the coach and say, you know, the team didn't qualify. But if he's not given uh, the quality players to qualify, if he's not given, for example, you're traveling for World Cup games and you're arriving, you know, less than 24 hours before kickoff, can you point the finger at a coach? Really? And the coach has no contract? Probably. <laughs> the issue of George Luanda Mina is that he's, he's been acting in a, in a temporary capacity. And the intention was always to, to bring in a coach. We all know that uh, whenever Renard left, um, probably about two years ago, uh, you know, the national side was not given a permanent coach. It was a situation that the new executive inherited, but... Uh, have already started or have already taken steps to ensure that a permanent coach is found and uh, this is where we are at this point. So that, does it show lack of seriousness on the part of the association for instance that we could undertake a, such a serious assignment with a coach in an acting capacity? It doesn't happen so often. Well, it shows. So many so you can't have somebody acting for two years really in an acting capacity. Either make it permanent for, for the coach or bring in somebody permanent so that you can have somebody who's fully dedicated. Now, you know, you inherit a coach who's part-time. The first thing you want to do is bring in somebody, which is what uh, we've done. We've gone through the process of interviews. We've looked at the individuals. We are now in discussion, uh, and we have been in discussion with Ministry of Sport, because as you are aware, all national team, uh, you know, costs and uh, the burdens of carrying those uh, high salaries of coaches, foreign coaches, is generally handled by the uh, Ministry of Sport. So that's where we are engaged at the moment in finalizing the details for the coach who will come in. It's been the trend over uh, many, many years that uh, the, the activities of the national team are funded through government. When will FAS become independent? We're working towards that. Obviously, our football is in a stage of evolvement. We're not where Germany, England, France, Italy, or even Brazil are. Uh, we are portraying ourselves as a vehicle that can partner with the corporate world. And if you look in the last uh, decade or so, we've seen more partners come into football. But there is scope to bring in a lot more. And those are some of the discussions we are having with cooperating partners to bring in more revenues into the game, to show football as a vehicle for marketing. Because realistically, what, what other vehicle can bring you, you know, audiences of millions of, of viewers if you want to market your product? If you're going to put a billboard on Independence Avenue, yes, you and I who drive past there occasionally will see the billboard. But if you're marketing on the jersey of the Nationals, or on the training kit of the National side, or you're associated with the national team, when you've got World Cup qualifiers, for example, next month when we uh, play Nigeria in the World Cup qualifier, 15 million Zambians will come to a standstill and everybody will be focused on it. So football is the most outstanding vehicle in Africa for marketing purposes. Now, our role is to take that message to the corporate world, indicate to them and show them how this football can take your brand or your corporate to a higher level. And maybe we didn't do that much in the past, but I think now this is the focus area for us, to bring in more revenues, because that pays for youth development, it pays for women's football, it pays for futsal, it pays for our Premier League clubs to have more money. It takes the game to a new level. Uh, uh, before we leave the, the issue of the Africa Cup, I want to ask you this question. Far as, as far as you did petition CAF um, on the eligibility of Guinea-Bissau goalkeeper Papa Masimbaya for, and CAF has ruled against Zambia yes. in favor of Guinea-Bissau. Yes. CAF asked Guinea-Bissau to provide documents, and we were talking earlier about <laughs> the issue of documents. They were given documents with letterheads, logos that said, this is the guy. You know, they said that we, we, we base our verification on what we are given from Guinea-Bissau. That's where it is. They got those documents. They say they are fine. They are happy with them. We were fishing. Say again? We were fishing for an excuse. 
No. So I'm going to qualify through the boardroom. <laughs> we, 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 we had strong we didn't have grounds. Tangible we already. had strong grounds to dispute, but CAF have said, based on what they're given, they can only make judgment on what they're given from Guinea-Bissau. So they've made their judgment on that. We've said, well, it's their decision. We can't really take it further than that. They're happy with that documentation. So we move on. You're happy with the documentation? Well? <laughs> I think if you took a microscope and looked at it closer, maybe, you know, you may say, oh, okay, this, this is a little bit, you know, surprising. But that's not for me to say. It's what CAF is happy with. Let's look at the issue of the coach. Um, you spoke about trying to hire a coach, and you've tried as much as possible to keep this under your wraps, but it's, it's gone into the media that you've engaged former South African coach. Is that correct? At a point where I'm still waiting to finalize, I can't put out somebody's name until I finalize the issue. But I can talk to you about the process. We went through a process of rigorous uh, selection and interviews. We looked at the qualities of the coach. And the coach we came out with, selected by technical committee, and I can safely say that it was a unanimous decision by the members of the technical committee who sat in that panel that the coach who was chosen was the best. But so the name is out there, really. You, you still do not want to talk about it? You don't know how to confirm it? I can only talk about a deal I've concluded. And it's, you, uh, you've got the name. What is remaining is, is payment, isn't it? And pen to paper. Final details. Pen yeah. to paper. So when we finalize that, we'll have a press conference. Everybody will sit in front of the table. Everybody will be free to ask their questions. To reconfirm the, the public. <laughs> <laughs> to reconfirm the name. They can ask all the questions they want on that day. Yeah. Are we going to have a new coach before we start the World Cup uh, campaign? That's our intention. And we obviously had, uh, you know, the elections and uh, a lot of issues that needed to, to, to settle down before. But uh, now that that is behind us, I think it's our intention to... Uh, conclude this matter. We are uh, meeting the ministry regularly on several issues under 20 tournament, which Zambia is hosting, being one of them, but also the coaching issue. So we will, we're quite confident that we will conclude and move forward for the World Cup qualifier. Are you, are you offering to pay part of the coach's uh, salary? We've got partners who, who are, are going to come on board and, and make uh, certain contributions towards that, uh, towards certain uh, elements of, of the coach's package. So it will be something that we are looking to, to spread out rather than just lump on government. As we look at uh, the World Cup qualifiers, and, and so many people are asking, one of the questions is, why has Faz stuck to Levi Manawasa Stadium and rarely used Hero Stadium? Is, is there a problem with the, with the new stadium? Yeah, look, I think the stadium managers would be better equipped to answer that but uh, i can say that there's there's one or two things that needed to be that need to be done at the stadium for it to meet the requirements of CAF for uh, international competition so once those uh, processes are done on the uh, stadium side then it will be eligible to be used we are given to understand it's a choice of fires no fires makes a choice because we've used the stadium before Yes, but Twice, I'm talking about a, a, CAF quali a CAF tournament that uh, has certain requirements set by Confederation of African Football to, to be eligible to be used for that, uh, that level of competition. What you're saying is that Heroes is not eligible? It isn't eligible currently. There's one or two things that still need to be done to make it uh, eligible. We'll still use Levy Monosa State. For now. I mean, when Heroes open, I, it will give me extra income. So I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> if there's anybody who's looking for Heroes to be open, it's me. It will give the association, uh, because the seating capacity is probably about 15,000 more compared to Mwanawasa Stadium. It will give us, uh, in terms of revenue, you know, probably uh, an extra million kwacha or so plus. You know, I would like to have that revenue to invest in my development programs. But uh, having said that, Ndola has been uh, wonderful. The service has been excellent. Uh, the staff there have put that stadium uh, at the disposal of the Zambia national team, and we've had some great victories there. And it will always be a place, even when the, the Hero Stadium opens, that we will occasionally, or we will take games to the Copper Belt as well. Because we have an audience there, and we have a, a football market there that, you know, that also deserves to be served. So we are also waiting for Heroes 
uh, the way you are for the Hero Stadium to be ready for that uh, level of competition. Let's look at uh, preparations for both the uh, World Cup qualifiers and the hosting of the Under-20 Africa Cup early next year. How ready is FAS? When you look at the Under-20... Next year is a few months away from, yeah. from, 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 yes. from now. It is. Yeah. But we already began preparation almost as soon as uh, the new executive walked into the door with the Under-20 side. Uh, the team has been camping several times. Uh, there was selection process that went on quietly behind the scenes to assess the players and, and look at the players who can play at this level. So a lot of work has already uh, gotten well, when, when it goes on quietly, uh, where do you put transparency in that case and when we talk about... Well, it's the normal, normal operations side. of the association to put the team together. Uh, we, we did announce that the team was, was going through the trials process, but I mean, it's not headline news that uh, under 20 side is being selected all the media were, were well aware about it. But uh, so the process began a while ago, probably May, June, we started the process to put this team together and uh, intensifying the, the program to ensure that when we step out on the field in, uh, in 2017 for that championship, we will have a team that can beat, you know, the best teams on the continent that has the uh, potential to become African champions. Uh, that can, you know, give joy to 15 million Zambians. We will 100% guarantee that that team that goes out there when that tournament kicks off will be competitive. Are you giving the same guarantee for the World Cup? Zambia has never been to the World Cup. What are you promising the people? Yes, I've seen Zambia 15 minutes away from the World Cup, 1993 in Morocco. So we've come close. We're in a group that, of course, um, you know, drew gasps in the hall there in Cairo when the draw was being done by everybody and all the, all the journalists and all the uh, football people. That was the talking point, the group Zambia is in. We find ourselves in, uh, in a group where the, our three opponents, Nigeria, Algeria, Cameroon, will probably field squads of 22 players, all of them playing in Europe, maybe with one local player or so. Our situation is different. We don't have the players at that level. But we didn't have the players at that level in 2012 when we became African champions. What we did was focus on our strengths, speed, fitness, determination. And those are the things that narrow the gap. So we go into that battle for, for the World Cup, knowing that on paper we may not be on that level. But when it comes to what we do on the field and the level of performance and the determination and the drive, we can narrow that uh, gap which is on paper. So we will go out there and give our best hoping that our best will take us through. That's what we want to do. We live for hope. Every team there, nobody, none of those teams there, everybody's hoping to go to the World Cup because it's a group where anybody could go to the World Cup. So That's everybody's doing their homework, everybody's doing their preparation, everybody's leaving no stone unturned, everybody's looking at their strengths and weaknesses and trying to capitalize on those strengths. So we will focus on what we are good at, take our team there and give them a run for their money. And if we play to the best of our ability, if we deliver 100%, we're in with a chance. Let's talk about the issue of, 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 of poaching and recruitment and the issue of Charlie Musonda Jr. comes up. And, and Zambia now has a, a constitution that allows dual citizenship. And, and there's been talk that you probably should take a more proactive stance in trying to approach the Musonda family. <laughs> Right. We've seen France win, 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 uh, go very far with, with players, really, mainly from Africa. Mm. Cape Verde on the continent doesn't have much of the, of the players uh, uh, locally generated. Yes, those boys, uh, especially uh, the young Charlie, has exceptional talent. You know, talent that, if nurtured to its full extreme, could see him become, you know, he has the potential to become one of the best, if not the best player in the world. And you look at uh, his brothers, also you know, attached in Chelsea, one of them in, attached in Chelsea, the other one is in Spain. So they, they show that they're quality players, but uh, you know, they were not born in Zambia, so they have other options which you know, maybe not all players have, the option to play for Belgium. You know, they spend some time in UK. It's been said they may qualify based on the amount of time they spent there. So they've got options on the table. We've engaged the family. We've spoken to, to Charles. Um, 
I, I, I met him in London earlier on before even getting involved with the association, uh, with a team that uh, traveled, including the sports minister who happened to be in London at the time. We had an initial meeting. And um, ultimately, it's his son's choice to decide where, where he wants to play. His dad, proud Zambian, and uh, we are seeing, we've been having discussions with him to see how he can help us in our quest to develop our under-20 side. And he's very keen to come on board and help his nation. He sacrificed as a player. He would love to see his sons uh, wear a Zambian jersey. But ultimately, the decision has to be made by the boys themselves. They are no longer boys. They are now, you know, over 18. So two of them are probably in their 20s. So they have to make which, the which means the chat now with, with the parents is not is not is not as much uh, does not hold much impact as we, we <laughs> as a nation would, would would anticipate. You probably have to go to the to to, the, to, to Charlie himself, Charlie Junior himself. Yes, we will, we will have that discussion. You've made an effort. We will have that discussion. It's it's early days. He plays. He's played. I think a handful of games at uh, the top level. And uh, yes, he's an exceptional talent. But he's a growing talent. He hasn't reached. Uh, that level where you can, uh, you know, maybe want to throw him in the deep end until he's had maybe a few more games at that level. That was the, that was the discussion and the opinion coming from uh, the dad that he, he needed to maybe settle down a little bit before we can talk about him playing at uh, the national level. Let's not forget he was playing youth football a few months ago. Besides uh, uh, Charlie Jr., Lamisha and the others, do we have other players bes besides the, the Musonda boys? that you want to, to talk to and, and, and get into the Zambia national team? Yes, we're casting the net wider. We, we recently received uh, some information about some potential Zambian players who are playing in France because their parents were the fathers were of origins of countries that were linked to France when they were born, uh, African countries, and, and those boys had since gone and grown up in, uh, in, uh, in West Africa and then moved on to France but had Zambian links. So we are, we are exploring that information. It's information that came through recently. We get reports about young Zambians who are playing football in the USA, where they probably have the best uh, development structures for young players um, in terms of, of how American youth football is run. So we are actively chasing up those uh, issues and trying to, to, to assess the level of the players who are there. So we're looking to cast the net wider than, than probably we've done in the past. We have, yes, great local talent, but if there's a Zambian out there who has grown up in different experiences, uh, developed his football uh, at a different level, we are happy to look at them as long as he's eligible to play for Zambia. You, you did talk about Charles Musonda and him having a passion to develop uh, uh, football in Zambia. Do we see him come back as a coach? He may come in a different capacity. you know. Technical director? <laughs> he could come back in a technical role, he could come back in a coaching role, but... Uh, we are looking to utilize the expertise he, he picked up because he's worked with Anderlecht, firstly as a player, as a youth coach. So he has certain uh, understanding of youth football that maybe we, we are lacking here. And we want to tap into that knowledge, that uh, understanding. And that's the, uh, the discussion we've had with Charles. And he's expressed his uh, happiness to make uh, that expertise available to Zambia. So, so do we see we any deal cards soon? I can safely say, yes, we will work with him. Um, what capacity or how many times a month or if he comes in occasionally, but we will work with him. We'll formalize the modalities of how it will be done, but his uh, expertise and services will be available to Zambian football. Now, what we've spoken about are more visible challenges that concern the fan in the now, but I want to look at other problems and challenges that you're facing as far as. One of them is the constitution, and, and we know that uh, FIFA manager for member association, uh, Primo Cavaro, was recently in Zambia and he did give FAS an ultimatum that we must have a constitution that conforms by September. Yes, and you know, it's, it's looked at as if it's an ultimatum to FAS, but it is actually a change that is, is being, uh, or that has been going through world football to standardize the, the way football is run. And uh, there are quite a few other member associations who have huge congress, like the one we do, where we have 350 clubs, 354 clubs for the last meeting for AGM. And FIFA's viewpoint is that it's extremely difficult to conduct the affairs of football with such a, a huge group. What they suggest 
and what has been rolled out across world football coming you know, into, into our arena now, as in the other countries who haven't met the requirement, is that that size of the Congress be reduced. Now, there's been a misconception that, uh, you know, by doing so, our members are no longer part of the association, have been sidelined. What FIFA are actually saying is that, uh, and the way football will be restructured going forward with a more provincial approach is that you as clubs in the province, you as members in the province, will be involved in the election of the people who will represent you at the Congress. So just like 15 million Zambians cannot go and sit in parliament, but we elect representatives to go and sit there on our behalf, the provinces will have representation. The clubs in that region will have representation at the Congress. It will be a case of deciding who is going to represent you there because we can't have 1,500 people. And our club base is still growing. In a year's time, we'll be talking about a Congress with 1,500 people because three representatives per club come through. Then it will be 2,000. And where do you draw the limit? We have to structure it in a way that makes it workable, that makes decisions come through quickly, uh, that brings order to the affairs of football. And that restructuring is totally in that arena to ensure that your message is carried through by your representatives and handled there at the Congress. And we move quickly, we make decisions, we take football forward to the next level. And how, how soon do we so see you conform as far as to what FIFA wants? Well, we, uh, we have the deadline. We are going to have a, a Congress on the, uh, the reconvened Congress on the 1st of October. Uh, obviously, 30th. Which means you, you will have missed the deadline. Yes, but uh, obviously we've communicated to FIFA that, you know, we can only congregate on a weekend and the 30th is obviously uh, a working day, which didn't work for us. So we, we will have uh, that discussion at that meeting and we should come out, uh, you know, in good stead. We should note that FIFA have been harping this message since 2011. But, uh, you know, we tried to avoid you know, taking a decision for four years, pushing it under the carpet, excuses, but ultimately the decision had to be made. And before the new executive came in, FIFA gave the final six month period to the previous executive in March of, uh, of this year and said, 30th September, we need to have this matter sorted out. So this is one of the issues you should have discussed at the age year. The last age, yeah. It's a re yes, but uh, it was decided that the elections would be the, the item to be dealt with, and this is the reconvene. So the items which were not discussed are now coming into... So what are, what are some of the key issues that the, you're looking at at the, at the, the extraordinary the, AGM that you're having in October? The, the, uh, the reconvene, yeah, we have to look at the budget, uh, the, the, uh, the report from the General Secretary. We have to appoint bankers, we have to appoint auditors. And of course, this, uh, this issue of the Constitution. So those are the key areas we will be addressing. It's a continuation of the AGM that took place in March. Let's look at the issue of, 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 of money and, and FARS. Uh, clearly, it's probably one of the uh, th big and thorny issues in the running of football in the country with a lot of suspicion and accusations and counter accusations. I'll start with the FIFA annual grant to FARS. This has been increased uh, from $250,000 $500,000. How does FAS plan to utilize this money? Yes, FIFA has changed its approach. When, um, initially when this money, the 250 before it, it obviously got increased, came up, it was more or less handed in the early days, and I recall 1997 when FIFA introduced this money to the associations, okay, here's your 250, do your football business. A lot of things went wrong, as you know, when money is given without uh, guidance on, on. So now we come into a new era with uh, Infant President Infantino, who has set strict guidelines about where the money for football goes into. So you don't just receive a check and then come back, put it in the bank and start to spend. You need to provide details of the programs you are going to run. So you're running your league, what activities are you doing there? Women's football, youth football, uh, referees development, coaches development, several different levels of the game. Um, running a program about good governance and transparency, which will receive some funding. Uh, the administration of the game receives its own area of funding. So you have to follow those strict guidelines and meet uh, what you will say. You will present your programs to FIFA. These are the programs we run in these areas. They will look at them and say, fine. 
the money comes, you must run those programs. If you don't, or you misdirect your money, next year when you reapply for funding, you will not receive a penny from FIFA. So it's already well designated where those resources go to. And uh, we are glad because the areas of youth development, uh, women's football, are receiving you know, good sums of money that will help us to get these areas of the game on track. Let's look at your own funding. I know that the previous regime did sign a new, uh, a new 5 million US dollar broadcast sponsorship that will run for five years. That's from 2016 to 2020. In a bid to be more transparent, tell, tell us more about what is contained in the MTN and, and other sponsorship deals. Yes. Uh, you, you push the transparency button. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> During we, your campaign. We don't have any Always secrets. Yeah. We don't have any secrets in terms of uh, the money coming in because it's, uh, it's money that has to be spent in the right places. We have a broadcast deal with Supersport that uh, you know, gives us uh, money largely going to the clubs because it's Premier League broadcast sponsorship. So there is a portion that goes uh, to the association and uh, the clubs are also given uh, a percentage of that money to run their operations. We came in and we found a five-year deal signed, but we've had a discussion with Supersport to say, um, you know, we'd like to maybe discuss this in more detail, the deal. And uh, probably after a year or so, we will re-engage them and see how we can structure it best to, to meet the challenges of the league, because we believe that uh, there's scope for, for it to be redesigned maybe and make it uh, a better deal for the clubs. We have a deal also with Zambia Breweries, which had fallen away, but uh, has come back on a, on a one-year sort of trial basis um, with uh, commitments to, to meet from our side on the marketing side. So they're back in, in the deal. They had, their contract had expired and they had indicated they wouldn't renew, but they've just come back uh, this year as well. So those are some of the, the areas we are looking at. The MTN also has a, a national team portion of the deal, which uh, uh, is focused exclusively around the national team. So they have the league deal and the uh, uh, national team deal as well. We had two deals fall away uh, before we came on board. The Nike deal, which expired in... Uh, 2014, it was not renewed for a year and then just before the change an attempt was made to renew it and Nike said, uh, well, you know, we, we haven't had any communication for a year. So this, uh, this allocation, which is for, we have two Nike allocations for Africa, you know, while the silence was on has been moved to Nigeria. So we came on board without uh, uh, the Nike deal, which was a bit of a problem. What do we have now? We're in discussion with kit suppliers, but uh, there were certain issues in the Nike deal, you know, that, uh, you know, kit suppliers were, have been, have been made aware of, and that negotiation now becomes a little bit more difficult because there are certain conditions that are supposed to be met which were not met, and then they become wary that, look, we, we come on board, you know, we may not get uh, the service levels we uh, expect. In, in short, Zambia is a difficult client. Well, I think the previous deal, the way, the way it was concluded, sort of has created an impression which we are engaging with uh, other kit suppliers to try and correct. One of the issues that you bring to the table as, 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 as a new executive, particularly yourself and probably your president, uh, is, is the issue of the business acumen and uh, trying to tap into the fact that football globally has become a business except in Zambia, probably. <laughs> How do you it hope is, to commercialize? It is, it is, How do you it, hope it, to commercialize football in Zambia? It is business in Zambia. Maybe we haven't got to where we would like to be, but uh, I mean, if you look at the last 10 years, we've seen uh, the revenues of the association grow with the introduction of sponsorship, but we would like to take it to a higher level because we believe that uh, the properties we own, such as the national sides, uh, the leagues, and even the regional leagues and, uh, and uh, you know, the lower level leagues have the potential to work for business. So we are trying to bring in the, uh, the business side of our knowledge and tap it into uh, the football side to open up the football market as, as, as I said earlier, as a vehicle that corporates can deal with to achieve their objectives as, as companies or as brands or as businesses through the power of football because it's a unique power. It touches every single Zambian, 15 million people. So do we have to see a huge difference? 
probably double the income from, from, from what you found? We've set high targets. We, of course, have to, for, for a brand to engage with you, you have to create an environment that fits what they want to achieve. So if you have a, an environment, look at, and I'll give you an example of Tiger Woods, where he got into controversies and a lot of his partners decided, you know, we don't want to be associated with this. Or the American swimmer who recently was involved in this issue of falsely claiming he was robbed in Brazil. Four of his sponsors have, have pulled out and said, no, we can't be associated. So the image of your product or the image of your association or the image of football has to be correct 100% for brands and corporates to want to be associated with you. If you're involved in daily fights and battles, no brand or no company wants to get involved with that association. Your best place to clarify this. Uh, is, is, is it true that apart from FAS, there's probably another business person owning the patent to the replica jerseys? There is a, a gentleman who registered the Chipolo Polo name, who we engaged with. We had uh, a meeting with him. We have ironed out uh, an agreement that he will, as a good, honest citizen of the country, hand over that uh, brand without, you know, without really a cost to the association to get back. We've had that discussion with him. So and we started fires out, and, and failed to, to patent our brand as, as, as Polo Polo. And you know, it's something that we should have looked at doing many years ago because, you know, Chipolo Polo has been a brand for how many years? As far back as, you know, maybe even before my, my second born son was born and he's in his 20s. In the 90s, 91? Yeah. That far back we should yeah. have looked at registering all the uh, patents and logos and uh, brand names, etc. But, uh, you know, we, the association didn't do that. And we've taken steps now to correct that. So we should uh, probably, within uh, the next 30 days, have that issue finalized and sorted out 100%. Club licensing is a new development in Zambia. Yes. How much progress have we made? Quite a lot of progress, in fact, because, um, you know, a set of guidelines was, was provided, five key areas that clubs needed to meet the criteria in, infrastructure being one of them, finance, uh, youth development, uh, legal, the legal structures, etc. So, as an association, we've been dealing with these clubs now probably for since about 20. We started to push it harder, I think, since 2014, and we are coming close to fruition with it in terms of uh, meeting uh, the key criteria for for being eligible. What this means is that when you have a club license, as Par Dynamos or as uh, City of Lusaka or Dollar United, you meet the certain criteria that are set. So you must have youth development structures, otherwise you don't, you don't meet the requirement. You must have uh, management that is, is dedicated exclusively to running uh, the football affairs. Your infrastructure should meet certain levels, minimum levels, so that football can be played the way it should be at a high level. How does this impact on teams that don't have sponsorship, good sponsorship? Yeah, I think when you get this, currently it's focused on the Premier League. The intention is to roll it out eventually as the game grows. But currently, it's your Premier League teams who, who largely have uh, uh, the support of their corporates. And for but now, very few teams have met those, 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 those conditions and standards. Well, we, I would say quite a significant number have made headway towards meeting those standards. Because in terms of, uh, of the services and the facilities, and you must have your own training pitches, etc. I think we've made tremendous headway, particularly this year in taking the clubs to that level. And there's been regular interaction between the association and the clubs to update them on and to assess where they are, where the gaps are, what they need to close. So they've been working tirelessly, the clubs, to, to close those gaps. And they've done a great job. And I must give them a pat on the back for their effort, the hard work, the resources they've dedicated to that because it's something that takes up resources. But they've been very, very determined. Tim, Tim's clearly, some, a lot of them are struggling, apart from a few that are, are, are bankrolled by, by bigger corporates. Uh, a lot of teams are struggling. And this is a huge cost on them. Yes, but as I said, we are, it's currently rolled out at Premier League level. Even at Premier League, we still have teams that struggle. All teams have, uh, will never have enough. But with a little they have, the, the key thing is to utilize it and uh, have a minimum standard. Otherwise, we will not be able to progress. If, for example, your team qualifies for the CAF Champions League, you must be certified as a club licensed team.
to be eligible to participate in, in the CAF Champions League. So it's really a requirement that is meant to drive football to a higher level and, and to take it forward. Yes, it will be painful because you have to dig deeper, but we all want to have football in a facility where you can come with your wife and kids and sit comfortably and enjoy the game there rather than, you know, maybe have to sit on, 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 the, on the ground if you're playing at, uh, at the higher level. So with the growth of, of the revenues of football, it will eventually trickle down and we will impose more restrictions at that level. But this is only step one of maybe 10 or 20 steps which we're taking with the Premier League, with the club licensing. One other issue I want you to address is the issue of unity. Uh, after you assumed office as a new executive, there were issues of, 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 of acrimony. And we had senior members of the executive step down. Have you made efforts to unite? I think we should differentiate between the secretariat, which is, where, which is what I, I run as the uh, general secretary. The executive is your elected members. But at the, at the secretariat, we did have a couple of resignations. Um, you know, those were individual choices made by individuals who felt uh, you know, it was time to move on. But uh, in the time I've been there, the two and a half months, I've worked uh, well with the uh, staff I found there. We've uh, you know, taken a positive step to take this association to the next level. And uh, there's total focus from everybody. There is no what you call acrimony, at least if it is there, I don't see it at the secretariat of the, of the association. Outside there, within the, uh, the football members, obviously it's like, it's like any election. There are people who will support one side, people who will support uh, the other side. And maybe that's where you, you may begin to hear that there's, uh, there's differences of opinion at that level. But within the operating structure of the secretariat, uh, everybody is 100% on board. Are you getting support from the previous executive? We have members from the previous executive who are still sitting in the executive. So we from those that left? Those that left, um, we haven't interacted much, although there is certain, some of them we, we still engage in football discussions, informal advice, uh, but we don't have a structure where, you know, uh, ex-executive members and uh, and the current executive will meet in a formal structure. But we do engage in a more non-formal structure. Not with everybody. There are those who, who are more open to engagement. Others prefer to keep themselves to themselves. Let me end on a personal note. Um, uh, many of the viewers recognize you as uh, doing commentaries alongside your dad. I want to ask you, how much influence did your father's love for football have on your career? I think my father's love for football opened the door for me to discover my own love for football. So it gave me an opportunity to meet players, go to games. And within that, I discovered that, you know, I had this strong attachment to football. It wasn't something that was directed or something that uh, you can do if you don't really want to do it. You know, it's something that you develop yourself and nurture and grow and you know, most of my life, up till this point, my jobs have more or less had a, a link to football with uh, Supersport because I was marketing manager for Africa. But obviously football was the key component in, in our marketing, which I did there. Uh, with South African breweries where I ran the Kosafa tournament, the PSL in South Africa, uh, the Bafana Bafana sponsorship and the Castle Regional League. Uh, before that, in the 90s, I worked with African Soccer Magazine in London with Emmanuel Maradas, a, a renowned football journalist who worked for FIFA later. So I would say 80% or 85% of the time I, I worked in football environments. And, you know, it's something, it's, it's something that you can't ask for. I can't imagine sitting behind a till in a bank and having the same passion that uh, I can get that doing a football. job that I, I have a feeling for, an affinity for. Uh, you've, you've spoken about super sport and spoken about having this passion and, and, and not really being satisfied working elsewhere outside football. I want to take you back to your appointment as, as Secretary General. It was mad with acrimony, I must say, <laughs> with leakage in papers that uh, probably you were fired at super sport and were not eligible. <laughs> Did you really feel bad and let down by the football fraternity at that point? I think the one thing that, uh, you know, 
may I wouldn't say I grieved, but I think the misconception uh, that I was fired from Supersport was something that you know I even considered uh, the possibility of legal action. Um, I had a good time at that company as I did at South African Breweries. I left on a good note with a contract to do TV production for Supersport with the Mpila Zambia show, which you know probably increased my my working income as a salary. You know it gave me a lot more in terms of revenues. So it was a, an amicable parting and an agreement that we would work together on other projects related to football because I felt, well, I've done my work part and now I can branch out into using my marketing skills, my TV production skills, the skills I've picked up all over from different environments and put them all together and, uh, and start this little business, which I did. And uh, I enjoyed that spell running the Mpila Zambia program, which aired uh, on Supersport and also on ZNBC. As we close, uh, Ponga, measurable targets uh, after your first year in office, first time in office, what would you say people will see after the first four years? I think we want to increase our revenue base because ultimately our programs depend on revenue. So we must bring in more corporate partners, bring in more resources into football. When we have that, we can set up better youth development programs because youth development is our future. If we don't generate quality, we will never have a successful team at the top. Uh, women's football, and, uh, and when I talk about football, I don't only talk about the entertainment role it provides, because it takes the kids out of a uh, difficult environment and gives them the opportunity to, to make something of their lives. It takes them away from the issues of the vices of drugs and uh, all sorts of vices that kids who are not given opportunity can find themselves in. And it gives them an avenue to take them out and, and into other areas. So that, for me, is as critical as the entertainment side of the game. Ponga, uh, after four years, we will invite you back <laughs> to ask whether you met your targets. Excellent. A pleasure chatting to you. You've been watching Sunday Interview, and our guest this evening was the chief executive of the Football Association of Zambia, Ponga Liwewe. I'm back next week with another exciting topic. Thank you for watching. <laughs>